are for Food and Water Watch. Uh, we are um, an advocacy group based out of uh, Washington, D.C. We've got about 17 offices across the country and um, food and water in Europe as well. So we work on some of the food and water issues affecting the European Union um, as well, including natural gas, um, oil and gas drilling. So I will just very briefly go through what fracking is. I think probably if you've made your way to this forum, you probably are interested or know a little bit about what it is. Um, but it is an unconventional way of drilling for natural gas that is much more capitally intensive than really any kind of drilling for oil and gas that we've ever known. So um, whereas we typically would go straight down into a pocket of oil and gas and the oil and gas would be under a certain amount of pressure and it would come up, um, we're now drilling deeper and deeper into harder and harder rock formations. Um, and not only drilling vertically, but also drilling horizontally. And we can do that now for up to two miles horizontally. Um, <laughs> so you can imagine because of just the sheer um, you know, level of how much further they can go, there is, like I said, it's, it's a very much more capitally intensive than conventional drilling has ever been. So just to give you a quick comparison, in conventional drilling, um, the oil and gas drillers use about 100,000 gallons of water to extract um, natural gas or oil out of a well. Um, in uh, um, fracking or horizontal hydraulic fracturing, what is commonly known as fracking today, um, they can use anywhere in between, you know, the average is about 5 million gallons. I've heard of one well in Ohio using 8 million, one well in Michigan using 21 million gallons just to frag one well. Um, and so what happens when they do that is, um, you know, they not only are using water, but they're also using silica sand, which we know is a really, really big um, airborne hazard, right? Um, and a lot of different chemicals, some of which we don't know, the ones that we do know are quite alarming. Some of them are known carcin carcinogens. Um, so it makes us always sort of wonder, if they're telling us about the known carcinogens, then what are they not telling us? Because they can sort of protect those um, under, uh, by claiming that they're a trade secret. Um, and they're still able to do that here in Ohio. So um, when all of this stuff goes down into a well, a certain percentage of it is going to come back up. And it's very contaminated when you drill something that deep into the earth, you're going to bring back some radioactivity um, because you know shale layers of uh, rock are radioactive. They contain radium and uranium and all of these different things. So all all of what comes back up is potentially radioactive, um, and it needs to be disposed of somehow because we sure don't want to put it back into whatever water source it came from. So contaminated that you're not going to be able to treat it through any conventional wastewater treatment plant. Indeed, there are no wastewater treatment plants that can handle this and actually clean this contaminated water. Um, so that's a really, really big concern here in Ohio. And I know uh, Professor O'Reilly is going to um, delve into that a little bit deeper. What I'm going to delve into today is what are the regulations that we have here in Ohio? What are what regulations? <coughs> do and don't do, and um, what has been sort of, you know, how, how, how have they been enforced here in Ohio? So um, one of the things that I think a lot of times people do think is that um, we have, you know, places like the Environmental Protection Agency, the Ohio Department of Health, um, the, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and that these agencies that regulate this process are here to protect us and to keep it as safe as, a, as they possibly can. Um, now there are certainly good meaning and well-meaning people within those, um, within those agencies, but overall um, there are certain things um, related to their, that are problems with this process and almost any industrial process that cannot, absolutely can never be addressed um, through regulation. So some of the things that um, I think that we don't think about 
um, are things like massive industrialization. Like I told you before, um, this is an incredibly intense, um, capitally intense, resource intense way to extract oil and gas. I mean, literally we're grasping for straws at the last um, drops of oil and gas. Um, so they're using a lot of water, they're using a lot of silica sand, they're using a lot of chemicals. That means truck after truckload after truckload of this stuff is coming in. It's it's an it's an inherent part of the process. It's not something that's going to be able to be addressed by regulation. They can't say you can't bring in the materials to be able to do this process, um, or else they wouldn't be able to do it at all. Um, so one of the things that um, the oil and gas industry has said over and over again is that fracking has not led to water contamination. Um, and I want to just warn you about um, believing that outright because it's it's really a semantics game um, so what they do a lot of times is say um, it's what they're really saying is that one instance that one moment where they actually the process of fracturing is actually happening to the well has never been proven to to be linked to water contamination um, as a result of that one instance where that actually happens so they're extracting that instant from the entire process. Um, really what we have found is, and, and you can't, you can't, you just can't do that, right? You can't do that moment of fracking without going through the clearing of the land and the setting up of the pad and the drilling down and the drilling sideways and all of those things are part of the process. And those things have certainly led to water contamination all over the country. Um, ProPublica, an investigative, um, journal, one of the few investigative um, journals left, um, uncovered over a thousand cases of court and government documented water contamination. Um, the ODNR very recently, that's the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, recently um, actually <coughs> finally admitted that there are a couple of cases in Ohio that have certainly been confirmed and there were a lot more complaints. Um, so one of the things, getting back to the regulation, that can't um, be prevented through regulation is where a lot of these cases of water contamination have been coming from, which is um, the steel casings and the well casings um, around where they drill that is supposed to be protecting our aquifers and our groundwater. Those things degrade, cement cracks, um, and over time it, it actually becomes a conduit for pollution into or contamination into our drinking water sources. Um, and that in no way could ever be prevented by regulation. You can't regulate cement, not crap. Um, so it's not going to stop, um, uh, prevent salts, heavy metals, um, naturally occurring radioactive materials, or any of those chemicals from returning to the surface. Um, and we've definitely seen in some inspection reports um, where that indeed has happened. Um, not just returning to the surface like through um, the well itself, but outside of the well, in the ground um, around it. Um, it's not going to be, a regulation won't be able to predict or control um, earthquakes that are induced by the activity, um, you know, whether it's drilling or whether it's the waste, um, the liquid waste disposal. It won't predict or control underground migration of toxic plumes. So if there is a toxic plume hidden, we're not really monitoring what's going on underground, especially when we're talking about these waste disposal wells. It's out of sight, out of mind, and the state isn't really monitoring where it goes. So we have no control over, not just because we don't follow it, but it, you know, our regulation is not going to be able to stop it from happening. All we can really do is monitor it, observe it, try to fix it, you know, those kinds of things. But the damage has already been done. So what, you know, with all of that being said, you said toxic plumes, you mean when they re inject the wastewater back into the empty? Well, well I mean, no. in, in any case, you know, if, if there is a case of, you know, a, a leak in a well casing and it happens to be, you know, the pollution is coming, the contamination is coming up through the well casing and then there's a crack and it's going out to the side into the soil, you know, there's no way for us to, if we're not monitoring it, we're not going to be able to catch it, obviously, very quickly. But there's no way, really, for us to control that, you know, if, if we don't know about it happening. I mean, 
know, we can try to mitigate the damage, you know, once it's already been done. But yeah. So um, so what what regulations are in place here in Ohio? Um, you know, we've gone over and over our oil and gas law over the last um, several years as this industry has been ramping up here in Ohio and we keep hearing from the administration and from the, the regulatory agencies that we have the strictest laws in the country. Um, and I, so that's another thing I want to sort of caution you against just uh, believing because um, we don't. Indeed, the strictest regulations in the country would be like that in, uh, um, you know what they have in New York where they're actually prohibiting this activity from happening in the first place That's the most stringent laws in the country laws typically are made um, If they are not made to prohibit an industry They're made to facilitate the industry being able to do the activity that they want to do um, and what we've seen in our um, regulations that have been passed around this industry is that almost every single time it's an instance of um, you know, those things that sound really good and, you know, it's like this common sense initiative or it's the um, energy bill or, you know, we're going to make these companies deal with local communities and have agreements with them for um, being able to use their roads and we're going to do that for the first time and for the first time we're going to let doctors know about, you know, what chemicals are, are in fracking fluid that they're using to, to drill. And all that sounds really, really great. We're going to keep radioactive waste out of our landfills. And these are some of the talking points that I hear when, you know, this, these pieces of legislation are being introduced or being debated in our state legislature. But when you scratch the surface, um, it's really doing exactly the opposite. The road use agreements and the 2012 energy bill um, that Governor Kasich administration basically wrote and got a sponsor for in our legislature. Um, you know, there's a loophole for it. If they can't come to an agreement on road use and what the company's going to do to mitigate the damage from a thousand trucks, you know, going on a road that can't really handle that kind of weight, um, they could try to make an agreement with the um, with the municipality. Um, but if they don't, you know, like I said, you scratch below the surface. There's a loophole for that in that they could just say. Well, we tried to make an agreement with them and we just couldn't come to an agreement. And the Ohio Department of Natural Resources could sign an affidavit saying, I vouch for them, they tried, we can go ahead and give them the permit and let them do it anyway. And really this was the last line of defense for some local communities because, the, and Professor O'Reilly will talk about this more, their local control has all really been taken away from them. Public participation has really been taken away. There is no public comment period on permits for fracking. Um, there's a very short public comment period for um, injection wells that are used to dispose of fracking waste. And what we've seen so far is that the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, despite not only, you know, a hundred people in the community asking for an official public hearing before they're permitted, or local elected officials and county commissioners saying, we do not want these in our community. The ODNR has all really ignored them. Um, they haven't done public hearings, um, even though under the law they can do public hearings, and they've just rubber stamped the permits and they've gone ahead and done it anyway. Um, so, so in in K6 2012 energy bill, which we heard once again, it's the strictest regulations in the country, but there were loopholes for trade secrets. There was after the fact chemical reporting, which means how can you prove that there's water contamination um, if you have a problem if you don't know what chemicals to test for until after the drilling?